Let's take a look at a little more abstract example. Let's imagine that this is our landscape right here. It delimits a certain area and it has, it can have different elements in it. For example, this landscape here, which has all these beans like this. Let's pretend that each one of these beans is a little plot of land. Maybe it's a farm field. This is an example of a landscape that has, in, that is entirely covered by just one type of element. It's all crop. Now let's imagine we add a little bit of diversity to this landscape. Maybe we have something that could look like this. You know, this field, this landscape here has not only the black beans, but it also has these green peas. But let's pretend that the green peas are grasslands. So now we have a landscape that has two different elements uh, in it. And in this situation here, the elements seem to be interspersed and maybe it's about 50-50. This is what we refer to as composition. That is how much is there and how many different elements are there. We can, we can also look at how the pieces in the landscape are arranged. Maybe one landscape has all of the cropland in one area and all of the grassland. Maybe this is pasture, so maybe all the pasture in another area. 50-50 still, but arranged completely differently at this particular scale compared to this one here where the pieces are all interspersed. We refer to this as the configuration of the landscape. The actual spatial patterning, not just how much is there and what types are there, but actually how they are physically arranged in the landscape. And what a landscape ecology perspective tells us is that this variation in configuration and in composition matters to the processes that we care about. That is, patterns affect process. Another important thing that you've probably thought about already is that a landscape is defined by a particular area and therefore has a particular scale of analysis. Landscape could be viewed from this scale here, this broad scale, but we could also focus on a much narrower scale. So for example, if I only look at this tiny little piece of landscape or this tiny little area here, if I can space it out appropriately, this area here is all grassland when measured at this particular scale. When it's measured and evaluated at this broader scale, obviously there's two different kinds. Now this scale may matter to the things that you're interested in. Let's take a look at this farm field here. This is shade grown coffee in Costa Rica. In the understory, we see the coffee plants. In the overstory, we see some tall kind of canopy of, uh, of forest. And let's contrast that with this situation here. Also coffee, but now it's out in the open and the forest is actually out here on the margins, outside and surrounding uh, the, uh, the coffee plantation. Now we have them side by side, these two very similar coffee plantations well, at least similar in the fact that they both grow coffee and they both have forest on them, but the spatial arrangement of the vegetation is very different between these. And you can start asking yourself, how might these patterns affect the processes that are relevant to coffee? For example, how might this affect pollination of the coffee plants? Many of the bees that actually pollinate coffee live and nest outside of the coffee and actually venture into the coffee to find the flowers, the coffee flowers when they're blooming. So as far as the bees are concerned, these two landscapes are very different and the processes that they carry out, the pollination service, is going to be very different in these two contrasting landscapes. Bees might have to go further and they might not even get to the middle of this field if they are too far from their, uh, from their nests. So this is an example where process is affected by the patterns in the landscape. So let's take a look at this beautiful stream here growing in this riparian area. We might be interested in trying to understand something like the quality of this water, how much nitrogen is in it, or how many algae are in it, or something like that. 
One way to do this is to try to measure the processes that are actually happening within the stream, or maybe something about you know, the leaves that are falling in from the surrounding forest into the stream and how that might be affecting the nutrient quality uh, and the nutrient content of that stream. This might work, but what's important is that to understand the processes that are happening, we actually study this at the right scale. And it might be that what's actually driving nutrient quality within the stream has to do with the movement of material from a broader scale than the one that we were studying. And this is why understanding patterns at the right spatial scale really is important in understanding the, uh, the processes that we care about. Similarly, if you were trying to understand the origins of this dead zone off of the Gulf of uh, Mexico here uh, in uh, near Louisiana, where the uh, Mississippi River dumps out into, you really have to zoom out and look at the entire uh, catchment of the Mississippi Basin, where the nutrients are actually coming from that dump into the water and uh, actually fuel the algal activity that sucks out all of the oxygen out of the water and causes these dead zones where it's very hard for any other organisms uh, to actually live. And most of these nutrients are actually coming from farming operations in the upper Midwest um, that uh, are losing nitrogen primarily, uh, moving into the water and fueling that algal production. So this is another example where understanding and studying this at the right scale matters. The processes here are driven by the patterns and the patterns are influencing the movement of nutrients through the landscape and into the Gulf of Mexico. So let's just take a look at this final set of images here, the cornfield on the left and the cornfields on the right. In some ways, they're very similar. Um, composition looks about the same between these two, but the configuration is very different. And now think about what processes that we care about might be affected by the composition and the configuration of this particular landscape and how that might affect agricultural production. And of course, we as humans are also part of these landscapes. We benefit from them, we respond to them, but we also help shape them. As I introduced earlier on, we form part of the diversity that is in these landscapes. We, we live in the landscape in ways that are heterogeneous. Our cultures are different across the landscape. The density of people is different across the landscape. Our economic structures. And all of these shape what our landscapes look like. And therefore, what the landscape will do for people and the environment. So we can't take ourselves out of these landscapes.